Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up, and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I am your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley, and today we're discussing a movie from 2020, Disney Pixar's jazz a Good one. I was wondering why this movie is called Soul, which is a specific genre of music instead of jazz. Because it was about souls. The original concept was just an entirely before time. What's it called? Before land? Before life. The great before. Was entirely based in that world. And the Joe character was created to give it some weight as it applies to real life. And then he kind of became the focus of the movie. Although I guess not really in a way. Well, not really in the sense that Joe is embodied by Tina Fey for half the movie. Yep. Which was a good twist for me because Soul from the trailers didn't have a lot going on for it. It seemed a little bit boring and basic in concept. And I was like, sure, Disney Pixar for free, I guess, now that it's on Disney Plus. Yeah, I'll watch Soul. It didn't seem, seem like it was distinctive other than it was a movie about a dude and a cat and some music. Uh, I can see that, although the Disney Pixar name is kind of enough for me to want to see an animated film. The Good Dinosaur. But it's funny that you called it Solatui because Jazz-a-tui. for me it was it's <laughs> because for me it was In Soul Out. <laughs> and so, well, Pete Doctor's other movie was Inside Out, and definitely it was uh, well not cerebral, forgive the pun, but it was uh, conceptual. Yes, it, it explored more of the human condition. It was very heady. Yep, it was heady. Yeah. <laughs> Um, There are a couple of distinctions between Soul and Inside Out for me, because I would give those movies two different ratings. Uh, Pete Docter has never been my favorite Pixar dude, although he apparently has taken the place of John Lasseter. Yep, he's the dude. But I was never a big Monsters, Inc. fan. Certainly not Monsters You and Inside I Out. I love Monsters Inc. and Monsters You. What's wrong with you? Never. It wasn't an emo. It wasn't an Incredibles. It wasn't those those early big ones for me. And he also did Up, which is a little bit better for me. So Incredibles and Nemo, those weren't my favorites. Ratatouille and the Good Dinosaur. I, I feel like we no. I feel like we're on either end of the Pixar Disney Pixar spectrum in terms the, of what we like. This is why we're complimentary co-hosts. If we do say so ourselves. But the afterlife, I was worried. I mean, it's not that it was all about Joe. And frankly, I didn't even notice that there was a cat on his shoulder in any of the promo stuff. And hmm. the cat comes to play a pretty big role. But I recognized that it was Joe. And then I recognized the great before. And I was like, man, that looks kind of boring. The before time hmm. animation, I get it, that it's a very basic place, right? These are unformed souls at their very beginning. And it's simple. A lot of haze and fuzz. But th- mm. it's a good thing they went with Joe because the concept art for the souls is super boring. And and I felt like it was for lack of trying because the mentors, their Picasso line drawings and stuff, it was kind of clever the way they move. But it's not like it took a lot of time conceptually to come up with that, right? The execution of animation and what we know of Pixar's capabilities isn't really stretched or flexed in the great before. It might not have been pushing the animation medium forward, but it was appropriate to the metaphysical state of the characters. But I think we need to get some things clear here. There was the great before where it's kind of got, it's like this vaguely karmic mentorship program where souls are being conditioned for life in the real world. And then there was the great beyond, which we never actually go to because Joe refuses to go. Which isn't it kind of weird that Joe's like the first soul to like refuse to give up on life? 
Like, isn't that a little bit convenient? He's got the residual lust for Wait life. Wait a second. I'm mixing things up. We got the great before. Yeah. We got the end, which is heaven or hell or the bright light or what have you. And then the great beyond. The great beyond is actually what we do see. The great beyond is that purgatorial moving walkway thing. Okay. And Pixar, unfortunately, these days starts with a deficit that they have to climb out of for their movies, as far as I'm concerned, because they're so adept at what they do. It's like, okay, this story could be told in live action or it could be told in simple animation, but it's not. Pixar is doing it. Wow me. What you got? And they have to kind of prove themselves before they can get on even footing to where they can convince me that their story is worth telling. And when it started with Joe, I was like, I'm, I'm OK with this. This is fine. And then he goes down the 2D wormhole where it's just vectors and empty space. And then he lands in the great before where all the colors are rudimentary. And I was like, oh, man, I hope we don't stay here for long because this is boring. And this movie in general is kind of a slow build, wouldn't you agree? Well, there's a lot of rule building, rule establishing that we have to kind of endure to even understand how these things work. I mean, when you're talking about rewriting the afterlife, there's a little bit of a learning curve there. Right. And the only thing that I thought would be worse than staying in in the great before Uh would be going back and forth between the world and the great before over and over and over again. I mean, we did that a couple of times, but hopefully it wasn't too many times. Yes, it was too many times. <laughs> it's, it this it was like it was like the fright night problem with Peter Vincent where it's like Peter Vincent <laughs> is going to face down Jerry Dandridge and then he's not and then he is and he's not and then he is but then he f- chickens out. Dude, it's there like, are, there are three people in the world who are going to cross reference both our soul review and our fright night review and you and I are two of them. <laughs> I'm just saying there was a lot of back and forth in soul. Let's pick a world <laughs> or a dimension and let a story play out. So because this plot got really unwieldy and convoluted. Full disclosure, I watched Soul twice. And I took a harder look at a movie that I wrote very few notes down about. And when they landed back in the real world the first time and 22 is in Joe's body and Joe is in the cat, I was like, okay, well, that's a simple twist. That's going to be funny, but at least it shakes things up a little bit. I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. But what I did notice in coming back to the real world is that it was a welcome shift back for me when we went from a detailed environment to the rudimentary design of the great before and then back into the real world, I was kind of relieved. I mean, you talk about switching back and forth, but weren't you happy to get back to the quote unquote real world? It wasn't satisfying to me because they get to the real world and Joe knows that he has to get back to the other dimension in order to reverse the switcheroo. Like they're in the world, but they're switched. And so you were just dreading the going back? Well, how else was their their earthly switcheroo going to be resolved without having them go back? I don't know. This was a washer for me. I was going to go with it, and it needed to look cool and be cool. And at first, it really wasn't. So when we got back to looking cool and being cool where we can play with Pixar's animation and style, then I was like, okay, just wow me. And I really wasn't thinking about how is this all going to tie up? There was just the inevitability of the fact that Joe was going to make it into his body, dead or alive, and not be in the cat for the rest of his life. But beyond that, I wasn't like, oh man, I'm dreading the return. Because we always knew that, that Terry was on the ground trying to get Joe back to appease the count. Terry, <laughs> not Jerry. <laughs> And Kelly actually spoke up the last time we watched it. And she's like, so is Terry, is he the bad guy in this movie? Or is she? Because hmm. it was, uh, Terry was voiced by a lady who has a, a pretty deep voice. Uh, her name is Rachel House. And to hear her speak, she has a voice, but it's not quite as deep as it was for the Terry character. Yeah, I guess like if there was a villain, it was either Terry or it was Death. Or 22. 22 was a villain? No, any more than Death was, who wasn't really present. Death was a villain in the sense, I mean, it kind of makes the end hell if, (laughs) you know, these characters' uh, purposes is to fulfill, is to have a fulfilling, satisfying, and fully realized life on Earth. That is what Joe realizes he wants. He wants to be able to 
live life to the fullest because I guess being a music teacher isn't really enough to have a fulfilling life. And then 22's mission was to find her purpose. She's finding her purpose. He wants to fulfill his purpose. And it kind of makes life all there is, which I guess, you know, is true. Man, that's heavy. That's philosophical right there. That's exactly what the filmmakers intended. I didn't care about any of that. (laughs) You weren't insulted on behalf of music teachers and hedge fund managers around the world? I have friends on social media who said they couldn't stop crying. I didn't get any of that. Maybe it's because I didn't identify in the slightest with any of these characters. I've never been a cat. I've never been a black jazz musician. And I've never had <laughs> his life. But Come to... on. These characters are supposed to transcend those very, very limiting vehicles. And jazz has never been my thing. So I watched it from a Pixar perspective to see if they could convince me. As much as I was hesitant of the concept of the great before when I got back, I was trying to, I was analyzing why I felt relieved that they were back in the human world. And I think I came up with it. It was different between the two viewings. And the first time I had decided that Pixar finally got human characters right. Um, Pete Doctor has been at the forefront of trying to usher Pixar into the human character frontier that hadn't been successful. Like you look at movies like Ice Age and things for DreamWorks or Shrek, uh, the humans look kind of dumb. And so the more cartoony you can make animals and cuter, the better. Whereas with Pete Doctor, we had humans where Boo looked crazy creepy in Monsters, Inc. Sully was a little hmm. bit more humanoid. But then even as far even as... Even in Inside Out, they didn't... Yeah, just a couple of years ago, none of the human characters were good for me. The Uncanny Valley is very wide and deep. And the personality characters were more cartoonish, and that was fine. But I felt better about the Joe character, about his family, about Ma Rainey, who hired him. Who was it? Angela Bassett. Yeah, what was her character? Theodora Williams? Dorothea. And that was the Easter egg and Onward in Max's In the House. Among their record collection, there was a Dorothea Williams album. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. But I felt good about the Joe character. Pixar reverse engineered this. This was originally a movie about the soul. And then it was a movie that included Joe, a human component, to offset just the soul great before. And then when they decided to make it about music and jazz in particular, they decided to make the character black. So in animating this, they went through great pains to make sure to avoid any because there's a long sad history of racial stereotypes and physical characteristic stereotypes of black people as they're portrayed in animation disney in particular is among the worst offenders so they tried to make it not like that obviously but more about colors and skin tones and the way light reflects on skin and so not only do i feel like they did justice to human characters but what ultimately i came to realize was the breakthrough of soul because i look at pixar movies and i'm like what are you what's your thing what are you demonstrating here that you hadn't been able to do before we talked about it for toy story 4 where they couldn't even show raindrops hitting the ground in the first movie and they had that elaborate sequence in the rain and in the gutter with the toy car at the beginning of toy story 4 and i'm like that's it it's the water for soul i thought it was the humans and then i realized it was about light and the haze and using that effectively in such a way that while it was just kind of blurry and hazy and added a little bit of texture to the great before the light and haze and the that sort of warm feeling atmosphere i guess so is what made my initial foray into soul's world of new york so unremarkable It's not photorealistic because the characters, the animated characters, their designs are heightened. The cars are kind of, the angles are wrong and it looks cartoony, but it felt so real. The environment and the light coming through the trees that it was almost too good to register as quality animation. If they had shot backplates or whatever of actual New York streets, it would have not triggered my admiration because it would have satisfied my brain to think, this is normal, this is right. Does that make sense? You're saying that the use of lighting, that animation technique was superior and groundbreaking, but in a way that didn't trigger that realization? 
because it was so perfect. The push forward and the innovation of this movie, because even Incredibles was entirely human characters and they were a little bit more exaggerated, but they didn't feel human or real. They felt like cartoons. And most of the characters in, in Soul also feel like cartoons, but the world didn't. The photorealistic world in the Wally sense, where you're like, whoa, that looks like Earth and not a cartoon, was pushed all the way to the closest I've seen to it being real. The sunlight coming through the trees and the way yeah. that the light moved across their face, the haze in the jazz club felt so real. If they used flares in a way that was supposed to suggest real lenses, which is obviously a trick in animation, I didn't even notice it this time around. The hustle and bustle, the life of New York City is pretty hard to capture. And the fact that they brought that to life for you, I think, was probably a lot more undetected things at work. You were aware of the lighting design to the extent that you were able to kind of marvel at it. But I'm sure there was pretty masterful sound design and background props and characters and a lot going on to fill this with life. And as such... When they do the old switcheroo and we're back in the real world and some of that skill might have gone under the radar, when they then put Tina Fey into Joe and Jamie Foxx yep. into the cat, I was like, okay, yep. we're going to keep this grounded in a fantasy, fun kind of world. And we obviously get to see the dynamics of them, 22 being in a body that she never, certainly never expected, and Joe being in a cat was cutesy, kind of light but at least kept it in a realm where I can see Pixar use their other skills in demonstrating how maybe the cat in some ways moved like Joe and how the Joe that we had seen before didn't move quite the same, didn't look quite the same because it was being piloted by someone who had never had a body. Right. And that led me to what I think is my larger revelation for soul. And that is the perspective shift that Joe had. He thought that music was his thing. Music was his spark. And maybe teaching is his spark. And the perspective shift that came by way of them switching bodies and him being faced with death right at his moment of triumph was the spark that sort of allowed for him to see how much he had going for him and for 22 to see the potential of human life. Him being in a cat made him realize how grateful he would be to actually be back in his body and how he was seemingly uninspired by his teaching position because he wanted his shot on the stage at the jazz club. And then when he got it, it wasn't everything that he thought it was going to be. It was just water and he was looking for the ocean. I get it, but is it a particularly revelatory sentiment to, like, be present and be happy with what you got? It just requires a spark that changes your perspective a little bit, allows you to recognize, to get out of your own head for a second, and acknowledge that to other people, what you have may seem much more idyllic to re-examine and recognize what you have going for you kind of a long journey for a paradigm shift, right? Yes. And I mean, I get that this is the construct of second chance movies. And unwieldy for kids. I can't imagine a kid who's on board with this movie in as much as Inside Out was a little bit too adult. And the death of Bing Bong, for God's sake, that haunts me and I'm in my 40s. <laughs> wow. And I didn't even Bing like that Bong. movie all that much. What's in it for the kids is the shenanigans and the Pratt Falls and the, I don't know, were there burp and fart jokes in this? I forget. Not really. And and uh, Pizza Rat. There's the pizza, the straight out of Ratatouille Pizza Rat. And they also did the Ratatouille um, perspective shift where you like get to hear the cat going meow, 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 meow. <laughs> and then they shift the perspective and we hear that the cat's speaking. Um, I'm not saying that this movie profoundly affected me in the way that I think the filmmakers were aiming to do. I liked it enough so that I could at least approach it from an adult perspective and appreciate what they were trying to do in a way that Inside Out didn't do for me at all. I did not care at all about the kid in Inside Out. I didn't know what was so very wrong with Joe to begin with. He got his promotion at work, but it wasn't what he wanted. And he had his complicated relationship with his mom and seemed to be okay with being dissatisfied about it. He got his big break and then abruptly dies 
it was such a shocking, almost inconceivable ending to the to the to the cold open or the <laughs> you know prologue of this movie. I was like, wait, what? And then from there, it was kind of an uphill battle with Joe. I, I guess I just didn't find him to be a very remarkable character to begin with. And then I just didn't buy that in this world, there weren't more people fighting for their pathetic little lives. Yep. I think that's a bridesmaid quote where Melissa McCarthy is taking Kristen Wiig's hand and is slapping herself in the face with it. And yeah. she's like, I want you to fight for your pathetic little life. <laughs> And I just kind of wanted him, I guess that's what I wanted for him from the start. And I guess that his, his gig or whatever motivates him to want to get back to Earth, to do it, to experience that. But in the end, it doesn't matter. In the end, it's just about, I don't know what, being happy oh, no. with the hand that you're dealt or something. The I don't know, it doesn't matter. That's both disparaging of, of this movie and also like the quintessential human condition. Like we're not all working towards the celebratory end goal here. It is kind of whatever. That's life, man. That's deep. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is I can appreciate what you were saying about how they moved the field of animation forward with this film in terms of lighting design and atmosphere. And I like what Joe's character does for black characters, not only in animated films, but in films in general. He wasn't caricature-ish. It was really appropriate story-wise in terms of the history of jazz and jazz as a cultural institution and what jazz has done for music. I just don't feel like it all gelled for me. The message didn't gel with the story with the characters. They were all kind of telling their own stories. It was kind of off and incongruent the whole time for me. Wow, I'm, I'm surprised. The reason I said that this movie was like Ratatouille, which you love, and I don't know if it's for you or Paloma or what, but this movie follows a lot of the same themes. You have the character who appreciates jazz in a way that no one else quite understands and is on the periphery of this world that he very much wants to be a part of. And no one really understands it in the same way that he does. When he's playing the music, it's typified on screen. And and Ratatouille wasn't even a Pete Doctor movie. It was a Pixar movie. But in the same way that Remy conducts this food symphony with light and music is what Joe does when he sits down at the piano and we see this video visual representation of music in a very basic animated style. Remy could have cooked or whatever, but it wasn't just about cooking. It was also about people enjoying the food and winning over D'Artagnan. What was his name? <laughs> what movie are you referencing? Ratatouille. Gusto. No, Gusto was the chef. Morticia. Barnaby Corn Carnivorous. Oh, An Ego. E Anton Ego. Look, the themes are pretty loose, but, you know, the, the whole idea of the rat piloting the, the human and showing him to do all the things in the same way that 22 had to pilot Joe and be convinced that's that switcheroo was, I mean, just thematically, it seemed to be not altogether different. I think that the difference between the two is that in the end, Ratatouille all kind of make sense. The characters, the concept, the world, or worlds, if you want to make a distinction between Paris and then the rat underworld, come together. Ratatouille is about the most unlikely thing, becoming a chef, right? Because anyone can cook. And the food critic, Ego, finds his purpose in life by championing the unexpected. But in Seoul, it's not like Joe is an unexpected jazz musician or even a person who's so asleep that he can't wake up and understand the joys of life. He's just like a normal dude who doesn't have it so bad off. Well, he took a look at that paycheck, didn't he? He wasn't going to get a raise or something when he went full time. I don't know. We spend a lot of time in the great before and the great beyond. And it's a lot of just kind of shenanigans to get to a really kind of oversimplified point or message. I mean, I suppose so. But they actually went to pains to simplify the message, to make it as open-ended and abstract as possible. There was an ending wherein Joe continues his gig and he's the jazz club star that he always wanted to be. And on the side, he's also teaching and tutoring kids in music. And then a new student comes through that happens to be 22 and they have a moment of recognition. And Pete Doctor and team felt that it was somehow unsatisfying, that it didn't feel right. It was better to not know 
22's ultimate fate. And it was better that, good or bad, Joe was going to go through his life. And the final line is, the one thing he knows is that he's going to live every moment of it. And that line was changed from, and I'm going to enjoy every moment. Because that's not what life is. Because there's hardships, and that's part of life too. And living seemed more profound. Living the moments regardless of what they bring. That sort of ambiguity and thrust works, hopefully, in its favor, I think it was deliberate. I'm having I'm having all kinds of reviewers' remorse about this film. Do you love it? Do I love Soul? I wish I did. I really wanted to. Right, but is it boring? Kinda. Look, I point to Onward, which I had zero hopes for. I didn't like the character design. I didn't particularly like the stuff that they went through, as cute as it was, or the characters, or the endlessly recurring dad gag. But then what I didn't expect is exactly to me what Soul didn't deliver, is that at the end of Onward, I was smacked in the face by the emotionalism. And I didn't care about their dad or whatever. They didn't even know the dude. But the way that they spun it, I was like, oh, and I felt it. And Soul didn't have that effect on me. I didn't care what happened to Joe. If it helps, from what fans have said, 22's trajectory towards Earth put her on target for landing somewhere in Asia. And I don't care. But I wasn't (laughs) blown away so that I was crying that life is so beautiful and precious. I didn't care. But I still liked Soul for what it was, for its execution. And it's a combination, I think, where it did finally convince me that it was worthy of being made. The story was good enough so that I was won over, and the animation revealed itself to me, and the filmmaking revealed itself to me as being worthy of what Pixar is coming up with this year. I get that this movie moved people. You can't argue with the message. It just didn't amount to a lot for me. You know, you need you need a shake-up. You need to spend a little bit of time in your cat's body so you can come crashing back to reality and realize how awesome your life is. I think it's really important for some people to get the wake-up call that Soul is. And I wasn't in the right place or mindset in watching this film. Appreciated a lot of things about it, but I didn't find it to gel, and therefore I think it was boring. Wow. Because I didn't relate to these characters at all. I felt like Soul also was not a movie meant for me, and yet I found enough to appreciate it. I don't know. It's fine. I like Tina Fey. I like Jamie Foxx. I guess all right, they did okay in their roles. They did great in their roles. The concept was interesting. The worlds were beautiful. None of them kind of made sense with each other. That's a review on Soul. All right from Wes? Yes. And a boring from Iris. Soul. Solely on Disney+. Plus. And we are Or Whatever Movies. Solely on every place where you get podcasts. Let us know what you think of our review or if you have a movie that you would like for us to review, 818-835-0473 or whatevermovies at gmail.com. Please follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our podcast. Please support us on Patreon. If you like what we do, help support us. Keep doing it. Right, Wes? Nailed it. Copy, print. Is that what they say? (laughs) But you got it, right? You understood soul? Like you got the movie? Um, no. I really didn't feel like I understood it. So I can't say that you got soul, but you're not a soul girl? Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier. I got soul, but I'm not a soldier.